right now on the Daily Debrief. The city of Chicago's lawsuit against actor Jesse Smollett gets the green light as actress Lori Loughlin and others face a new federal charge also. I have a right to be uh, judged by my peers or the jury, how they say in this courtroom and not you. A defendant's temper flares as a jury hears evidence that could keep him alive or send him to death row. Plus, this was a crime of rage. This isn't a contract killing. A jury deliberates the fate of a man accused of murdering a doctor. The defense says it was two other men, not him. You see a hammer and they strike their victim. The Daily Debrief brings you the day in court. It's Tuesday, October 22nd. Welcome to The Debrief, everybody. Two separate legal matters involving two separate actors top our broadcast tonight. First, new charges from a federal grand jury against most, but not all, of the remaining defendants in a college admissions cheating scandal. Actress Lori Loughlin and her husband are among the 11 parents who face new charges related to the alleged bribery of college admissions officers. The added charge is conspiracy to commit federal program bribery, and it relates to alleged attempts by parents to secure athletic placements for their children with, quote, little or no regard for actual athletic ability. The new charge carries a possible sentence of up to five years. Other previous charges carry stiffer penalties of up to 20 years in federal prison. Federal prosecutors also today filed, filed rather, new charges against officials from Georgetown, the University of Southern California, and UCLA for their alleged roles in the scandal. Also, a federal judge is allowing the city of Chicago's civil lawsuit against actor Jesse Smollett to move forward. Chicago filed the claim after the local prosecutor dropped criminal charges against Smollett. Police maintain he concocted a racist and homophobic attack with two other actors with whom he had worked. The city wants Smollett to reimburse $130,000 in police overtime spent investigating the case. Smollett maintains he did nothing wrong. Attorneys Bernarda Villalona and Linda Kenny Bodden are with us tonight. So, Linda Smollett, not a surprise here. We've got yeah. a Rule 12b6 motion. It's, it's not a heavy standard. Usually courts keep these cases alive right after the pleadings are filed. Uh, they like the facts to develop before they dismiss them. Yeah, but here it's, it's really dangerous to Smollett because here's what could go on here, Aaron. They could then let Smollett testify under a deposition and then come back in Chicago and try to indict him for perjury. That's what's really going on here, in my opinion. They get, he's the city, $130,000. They're going to survive with or without it. They want to get Smollett. Well, is the prosecutor even going to go that far, Bernarda? Because we watched the prosecutor dismiss the criminal case against him. Yeah, but remember that a special prosecutor has been appointed to look into the investigation as to why the case was actually dismissed. So different prosecutors, so can be a different result. Could be different, but we heard the original prosecutor say, well, I just disposed of this the way I would dispose of this level of a case against the average person, so why should he be treated separately? That'll shake out uh, as we roll along. Linda, I'm going to keep an eye on things to see yes, if your, if your uh, prediction comes true here. Let's talk about uh, the Lori Lachlan situation, this case is piling up. Prosecutors are alleging more and more conspiracy here. What's the big danger? Well, the big danger for obviously more prison time. But here, if you go to trial, guess what? Conspiracy, you can get all these hearsay statements in. So Lori Lachlan could be in trouble because the, the government said to her, you want to plead? Plead now, we'll give you a deal. You don't want to plead? We're going to treat you like every other defendant in court. And this is what happens every day in federal courts. And stack up the charges here, not getting a Felicity Huffman sort of sweetheart deal for pleading guilty and then walking away. The Jeopardy's building and building. That's right. Felicity Huffman, she knew when to plead. She got out early. And because she got out early, she had uh, less charges charged to her. But the other people, ugh, they gave you a heads up and you didn't take it. And Linda, the facts are a little bit different here. We have a couple of actresses accused. This actress, we're talking about bigger dollar amounts. Do the facts make a difference? Yes. The more the money, the more likely that the sentence will be greater than the one previously given. Two cases to keep our eyes on as we move along. The Florida defendant, meanwhile, convicted of murdering his pregnant ex-girlfriend and her unborn child, is calling friends, family, and experts to the stand in an effort to spare himself from a death sentence. Markeith Lloyd admitted he shot and killed his ex, Sade Dixon. He claimed it was self-defense, but the jury did not buy that excuse. Lloyd injured Dixon's brother in the process, and after leading authorities on a manhunt, he's accused of shooting and killing a police officer. That officer's death is for a separate trial. The defense, at this point in the case, can present any so-called mitigating circumstances it wishes. 
Here, Lloyd's sister testifies that Lloyd struggled to adapt to technology he missed seeing develop while he served time in prison on an old case years ago. Plus, she said he was paranoid. It's what I would call arrested development. Which means what? It's almost as if time stood still for him while he was away. So when he came out, it was still being 22, still singing the songs that was on the radio at that time. So almost as if nothing had changed as far as time and people, places, things. You know, basically just letting him know, like, this is the era of computers, so everything is being done that way. And did he become a Facebook person? Very much so. And he would post on Facebook all the time? Frequently. Have you read some of the things he posted on Facebook? Yes. Did he ever indicate to you any concern or fear that he was being watched by the police or the federal government? Yes. Lloyd's brother agreed that Lloyd was paranoid about others trying to hurt him. I was like, hey, what's going on? And then that's when he was like, These cra they, they trying to kill me, they trying to kill me. So I said, who? I'm like, who? And he was like, uh, he was like, these crackers, these crackers. So I was like, calm down. So I was like, calm down. I was like, everything will be all right. But he was like, no. He was like, if they kill me, I'll be back. I'll be back. So I'm like, but I don't want you to. I don't. I said, I didn't want you to be back. I want you here now. Like, I'm, I'm selfish. I don't want you to leave. You, you've been gone for so long anyway. Another of the defendant's sisters testified that she struggled to visit him in prison on an old charge and that he would sometimes go off on rants. And after he got out of prison and got released from the halfway house, did he live with you? Yes, he did. For how long? Uh, maybe about a year before I got his house. Now, during that period of time, was he working a lot? Very much. And did you know that uh, he was working at Texas Chicken? Yes, I did. What did Marquis th think about holidays after he got out of prison? That they were of the devil, so to speak. They weren't days that we should celebrate. Why? I can't say why his, what his reason was, but he just believed that they were evil. On cross-examination from the state, another of Lloyd's sisters faced questions about why she apparently didn't tell the full story of the family's upbringing before this phase of the case. Because your father was in the military, that is why you received the benefits, correct? Yes. And your dad died when you were about five? Five, yes. And when Mr. Lloyd was about four? Three. Three. Would you agree with me that the household that you grew up in was a loving, close-knit household? Yes, we were. And you and your siblings were disciplined as children, right? We were disciplined. Okay. You don't remember that discipline being violent, correct? Yes, it, we got beat with a switch, a belt, a stitch and cord. Do you remember being asked, was there ever any kind of violence or abuse in your house as a child? Your answer being, I mean, we were disciplined. I then asked, sure, and you said, yeah, but as like violence, no. It was discipline, back then it was discipline. That's how she disciplined us. Do you remember describing the discipline as normal, run-of-the-mill discipline, just normal discipline? That's, no, that's how African, most African Americans get disciplined that way. So back then it was normal for us. And that legally is what we call impeachment by prior inconsistent statement. Let's move on, though. After one of Lloyd's friends testified that he had been kidnapped, the judge made a ruling on a piece of evidence which angered the defendant. The defendant said the ruling resulted in the judge, not the jury, deciding his ultimate fate. I don't have it with me. I, I left my uh, note in my, in my cell, but uh, I wanted to address the issue that he, that he uh, emailed you about to evidence where he where it was evidence that I had some kind of brain brain damage, but you didn't allow my defense enough time to present the evidence to the jury. So I want to object to that and I want it on record. And it's supposed to be addressed to the jury and not to the judge. 
I have a right to be uh, judged by my peers or the jury, how they say in this courtroom, and not you. Thank you very much. Go on about your business. Okay, that's his opinion on this. Lloyd's son has been institutionalized for schizophrenia. Keep that in mind. Lloyd's daughter, however, testified that Lloyd was in prison from when she was four years old until when she was about 20. She described on the stand how much the defendant means to her and to his granddaughter. He gave her some advice that even me as a mom, I didn't think to say to her, when you make really good choices one day, you can become the president. And she said, I want to be the president. I want to be the president of the United States and America. And he's like, well, yeah, you can do that, but you have to make good choices or you can be a lawyer. And he said, and if you're a lawyer, then you can help your granddaddy. And she was like, oh, I'm going to be a lawyer because I want to help you. And he told her, so you have to make good choices. How important is he in your life? He's very important to me. Just how much of an impact he is is just amazing. Even with my siblings, he's helped my sister. My sister's on a full ride scholarship at UConn for track. He's contributed to that. With my brother, he was having a hard time with my mom. He stepped in as a man and had a conversation with him versus the way other men came at my brother. Um, just the respect that he has for people and how understanding he is. My dad helped me get through a lot of stuff when I was younger because he listened to me. Um, I think that he knew that how I felt and how I was feeling. <sighs> this is all evidence that the defense is presenting to try to save the defendant's life. But at the beginning of this phase of the case, the state argued that none of these mitigating factors were enough and that the defendant should be put to death. You may consider the aggravating factor that he was on probation at the time he committed that crime, which will be explained to you again by David Kennard shortly. You may also consider that he has been convicted of the prior felony involving the use of or threat of violence to another person. And those would include his conviction for battery on a law enforcement officer in 1998, the murder of Sade Dixon, the attempted murder of Ronald Stewart, of Stephanie Daniels, and of Dominique Daniels. So for each count, you may consider that the defendant has been convicted of five prior felonies involving the use of or threat of violence to another person. And when you are determining the proper punishment for the defendant, for the defendant's decision to murder Sadie Dixon's unborn child, there's a third aggravating factor that you may consider, which is that the victim, the unborn child, was under the age of 12 years old at the time he was killed. Attorneys Linda Kenny Baden and Bernarda Villalona are back once again here. So Bernarda, we heard the state side of things right there. The defense is just putting everybody out there, the family. Then we heard from a bunch of experts giving psychological assessments, everything to try to save the defendant's life. It's a harsh contrast to listen to both sides and what they're ultimately asking for at this phase. It definitely is, but you got to think that all the defense needs is for one juror to disagree and say that he shouldn't be given a death penalty in order to avoid getting a death penalty sentence. So whatever works, I'm going to throw everything in there, including the kitchen sink, in order to save his, his client from being sentenced to death. And Lynn, I wanted to ask about this, what I took to be a so-called collateral matter, trying to impeach the relative on the way the family was raised. At some point you get to the point in the rules of evidence where you're getting too far afield from the core issue here. Should the judge have cut that off a little bit? Yeah, I don't even think the prosecutor should have gone there because I, I understood exactly what she was saying, that that was normal, the type of discipline in her family. That was the way they were brought up. So when you ask me about the discipline being normal, that's what I would say. The prosecution, look, has to get over the fact that he has some value to the daughter, to the granddaughter, and contrast that with the fact that they're also, defense is saying that he's also paranoid and has psychosis. And if the jury says, hey, look, both of those mean he shouldn't die, one juror can say that. And Bernardo, we watched uh, the defendant fight with the judge there a little bit over an evidentiary ruling saying, look, I want the jury to hear all this so the jury can decide my fate. Legally, that just didn't seem like it held much water as a legal argument. The judge decides the evidence issues, the jury decides the core facts. Yes, it does. So the judge, of course, uh, makes all the legal decisions in the case. And for the jury, is for the jury to decide any factual matters in the case. But obviously, the judge has to keep order. 
Judge has to keep order in her courtroom and decided that this is a legal question and I should be the one deciding that because we don't want to confuse the jurors either. And that's what the judge is there for too, is to make sure that the jurors don't get confused by either party questioning. Exactly. And still ahead tonight here on The Debrief, a delay in the case of a man accused of murdering an Iowa college student. Plus, the jury has the case of the Florida man accused of murdering a doctor as a hit man who had to wait to get paid. A multi-day suppression hearing in the case of a murdered Iowa college student has been postponed. Molly Tibbetts disappeared in the summer of last year, and a farm worker, Christian Rivera, eventually led police to her body. A hearing to determine what evidence is legally allowed in Rivera's trial was canceled due to a death in the family of one attorney. The hearing is now scheduled for November 13th. Funeral services are scheduled for Thursday for a Tatiana Jefferson. The Fort Worth woman was a victim of a police officer's bullet two weekends ago. Her father sued to shut down a memorial service in her honor, which had been planned for this past weekend by her aunt. The father is now handling her affairs, even though the aunt disputes that he is Jefferson's actual father. A grand jury has yet to indict the officer who killed Jefferson by shooting her through her bedroom window. A Florida jury is deliberating the fate of a man accused of murdering a doctor with a hammer. Teresa Severs did not show up to work, so another doctor checked on her at home and found her beaten to death with a hammer. Nothing, including money, had been taken. Police think her husband asked for help to kill her. Investigators say that husband, Mark Severs, hired his friend Curtis Wright and Wright's friend Jimmy Rogers to kill the wife. Rogers is on trial. Wright cut a deal and testified in this case. Severs, the husband, faces a separate trial later on. Rogers' defense is blaming Dr. Severs' murder entirely on Wright. They say their client was just along for a car ride to Florida. In closings, they say surveillance video from the day of the murder clears Rogers. The Walmart video was before this happened. The gas stations are when they're leaving. I want you, when you go back to deliberate, I want you to look at those videos again. Because you're going to find something interesting in those videos. When Jimmy Rogers and Curtis Wayne Wright walk into Walmart at 11 o'clock in the morning, Jimmy Rogers is wearing black shorts, white wicking t-shirt. Curtis Wright is also dressed. Look at the way he's dressed in that video as he goes in the store. Then I want you to look at them when they're driving back up to Missouri. Jimmy Wright, you saw him, just showed him walking into the, the gas station. He's wearing the same clothes. Curtis Wright, he's changed. He's wearing different clothes. The clothes he was wearing at Walmart, they're all covered with blood. So he had to change those and get into something else. I'm asking you to look for yourself. Look at those videos. Prosecutors say not so fast. The state claims defendant Jimmy Rogers also changed his clothes. It's just a more subtle change. You see these shoes? Black shoes. Plain white t-shirt. Mr. Wright's driving, not Mr. Rogers. This is a still photo from the video at the Walmart in Fort Myers that's in evidence. You see Mr. Rogers walking in here with these sneakers on. If you play the video, you'll see him walk by a little white rim on the sneakers with a little design on the side of the sneakers. You also get to see those sneakers in Missouri later on. Those black Oxfords from the Bushnell show. I guess it's as good as mine. From the video, see the t-shirt Mr. Rogers has on? See the little design? On his arm, on his left arm, in the picture as he walks by. This is the t-shirt he has on at the Bushnell show. No design on the left arm. Watch it yourselves. Make the decision for yourselves. Different shirts, different shoes. So Mr. Wright wasn't the only person who changed his clothes. The jury asked to review the defendant's ex-girlfriend's testimony during deliberations. The ex-girlfriend said the defendant confessed to her and that she even helped him dispose of evidence after detectives showed up at their house. The box of uh, gloves, the ball peen hammer, and the um, dress shoes that he wore. And what was in the black backpack? The rolled up jumpsuit 
I sat in the car and he went in and got his phone and put under a water fountain and then crushed it and and then got back in the car. And did he have the pieces of the phone with him when he got back in the car? Yes. And then where did you all go? Uh, headed back towards home. And while you were heading back, did uh, Mr. Rogers either request you to do something or do anything with the parts of the phone? Yes, to throw them out the window. And that day, what did you do with what was in the black backpack? He had uh, told me to throw it out the window into the river on 47, but I was like in shock and my response delayed and I threw it out a little after the bridge. That's what the jury was asking to zone in on earlier today. So let's jump in with the panel. Linda Candy Baden, Bernarda Villalona. Bernarda, it looks like the jury's not so much focusing on the clothes as the jury is focusing on that witness. Is she believable? Keep in mind, she is getting paid. It's stacking up to be $19,000 plus, $400 a month. For some reason, that's what the sheriff's department is giving that witness we just heard from, does that discredit her testimony? Well, it definitely causes you to pause as to her testimony because obviously she is receiving some kind of payment. I don't know if it's relocation fees. I, I really don't know why there's so much money that's being given to her because I can understand prosecutors relocating a witness for their threat of their safety, but I don't know why is it still lingering for years being paid. But either way, the reality is, is that if you have an issue with her testimony, testimony, you're always uh, determining her credibility. You look for the corroborating factors. You have the corroborating factors here because the police went back to the location where she says she tossed these items, and guess what? They recovered these items that she said were tossed. So you say that it all rings true. Linda Kenny Baden, what do you make of the clothes? Is it different clothes? Are they wearing different clothes? Is one of them changed? Is the other one not? Is, is it just shadows from different lighting conditions and low quality cameras? What do we make of the clothes? I don't know, except that we know that there was a jumpsuit that was bought to cover the clothes up, whatever clothes they are, and if they were changed. So that jumpsuit's thrown out. The only one reason that jumpsuit's thrown out, in my opinion. But I think the jury is hung up and is upset, probably about all the money being changed. But they needed the state needed Needed someone to support Wayne, uh, Curtis Wright, and they have another person. There are a lot of bizarre Rogers. elements here. We're going to keep an eye on this. The jury saying we need more time to deliberate, please. That was the note the jury just uh, handed to the judge. The judge is asking them how late they want to go. We'll keep an eye on it for you and be back live tomorrow at 9 a.m.